Hey Cool Worlders, it's David. Before we get into the meat of today's video, I have to start by giving a huge congratulations to the NASA Mars Insight team who successfully landed on the Red Planet as of Monday. Of course, it's really exciting to see what all the science is going to be uncovered about the interior of our next door neighboring planet, but of course also it's just amazing that we're starting to land on Mars pretty regularly and successfully now. So the future looks bright. But today I'm not going to be talking about Mars. I'm going to be talking about another NASA mission, which is literally closer to home, although it's looking much farther afield, and that's the NASA TESS mission. I'm going to put a link down below in the description where you can find our previous episode about the TESS mission. You can learn all about the background of this thing. But in a nutshell, it is a planet hunting spacecraft using the transit method. So obviously an exoplanet research team such as ourselves here at the Cool Worlds Lab are pretty excited about the TESS mission. Now you might not know this, but the reason why we are called the Cool Worlds Lab is not because it's like a play in words and we're trying to be like dope planets or something. It's because we really want to find planets which are thermally cool. That is to say they are at long orbital periods away from their star. That's because these types of planets are far enough away from their star to be potentially habitable or host large exomoons or rings around those planets. And generally they're just far less well studied than their short period counterparts. Now there is a problem when it comes to TESS and cool worlds. And that is that unlike Kepler, TESS will only look at each field for about a month, and that severely limits its ability to detect long period planets. When NASA's previous planet hunting mission, Kepler, was looking for planets, it had this criteria that in order to discover a planet, it had to see at least three transits of the planet in front of the star. Okay, so because Kepler only looked at the same stars for four years, then the longest orbital period planet it could detect that way would be four over three years, 1.33 years. Now me and my team actually a few years back sort of pushed the envelope on that a little bit and we argued that, hey, even two transits is enough as long as you have continuous photometry in between it. And that allows you to find even longer period planets. In fact, the upper limit, I suppose, would be four years if you had one transit right at the beginning and one transit right at the end of your time series. But could we go even further and confirm planets that display just a single transit in our data? If we could, it would be great. It would really extend the ability of tests to discover planets not just with month-long periods, but going much beyond that, even planets at the right distance for liquid water on their surfaces. Let's just assume for the moment that you can indeed confirm that this single transit that you see is a real planet. And I think that is actually reasonable that we will be able to do that. Even if you can do that, it's kind of a frustrating situation though, because you do not know what the orbital period of the planet is, one of the most basic pieces of information about the damn thing. And that's because, you know, normally we get the orbital period just by literally measuring the time difference between two transits, but here we just have one, so what do we do? So you might think, quite reasonably, that the transit duration of this single transit should tell you something about the orbital period of the planet. Okay, to see how this might work, let's start from the fact that the transit duration will be equal to the distance covered by the planet during the transit, divided by the speed of the planet during the transit. We can estimate the distance traversed during a transit as being pretty much equal to the stellar diameter. So if I know the stellar diameter and I know the transit duration, then I should be able to figure out what the velocity of the planet was. Via Newton's laws of motion, we can actually just convert that velocity into a period, right? Well, no, because this only really works if you know the orbital eccentricity and argument of periastron already, which of course we don't. And because of this, we really are not able to constrain the period that well from a transit duration. It only gives a very weak constraint. So you have a situation where you see a single transit, but the period of the planet could be anything from a month up to decades. A Bayesian would say that the constraining power of your data and your model is weak. And therefore, your assumption for what the initial distribution of periods is, or to use the correct language, the prior, will have a strong influence on your result for what you think the period will end up as, or to use the correct language, the a posteriori distribution. Said another way, poorly constraining data 
means that you will be heavily influenced by the prior. In fact, in the limit of your data placing no constraints whatsoever on the result, then the result should actually equal the prior. Now we actually do know quite a bit about the distribution of exoplanet periods because after all, hey, we're not young pups in this game. We've been looking for planets for about two decades now. It turns out the period distribution is nearly log uniform, which can also be shown to be mathematically equivalent to saying it's inversely proportional to period. That actually turns out to be a natural consequence of having stable orbits in a dynamically packed system. And indeed, Kepler has pretty much seen that distribution in its data too. Great, so let's just use that distribution as a prior when we fit these single transits trying to figure out what their periods are, right? Mm, no. Now, this is subtle, but the distribution of orbital periods that a mission like TESS or Kepler will observe does not actually equal the true distribution of all planets out there. For example, a short period planet, which is whizzing very quickly around its star, must be very close to the star, and therefore has an increased chance of having the correct alignment to cause a transit. Long period planets, on the other hand, are kind of unlikely to line up in just the right way to cause a transit. Now, this is a well-known effect, and we've known about it for a long time in the planet hunting game. It's called geometric bias, and its effect is inversely proportional to the orbital radius, the separation between the planet and the star. So that means that a planet which is twice as far away from its star is one half as likely to have the right alignment for us to see it transit in our survey. And thanks to Johannes Kepler's third law of planetary motion, we know how to convert from orbital separations into orbital periods. It turns out that this geometric bias ends up scaling as the period to the index of minus two thirds. So as an example of that, if I increase the orbital period of the Earth from one year to eight years, it would decrease the transit probability of the Earth as seen from an alien observer by a factor of four. Okay, so surely all I have to do now is just multiply this geometric bias thing by the intrinsic distribution we talked about earlier and I will end up with the correct prior, right? Wrong, because these are not any ordinary transits we're talking about here. We were talking about single transits, remember? And single transits get affected by another bias Yes, another bias called the window effect. Okay, so let's imagine that we have a star which we monitor with TESS or something for one year continuously. And we know in advance that that star has a transiting planet around it, but we know nothing else. Now let's imagine that we get lucky and in our one year window of data, we indeed see a single big fat transit. Okay, so what's the orbital period, the time between transit events? So could it be, let's say, 100 years? Sure, it could be 100 years, but that seems unlikely, right? Because I have one year of data. So the chance of a 100-year period planet just happening to transit in my one-year window is pretty small. In fact, it's one in 100 or 1%. So let's try something smaller. What about a 10-year orbital period for the planet? Is that any better? Well, yeah, actually it's 10 times better because now the probability that a 10 year period planet would happen to transit in my one year window is one in 10 or 10%. So this thought experiment reveals to us that the probability of seeing a single transit within a fixed window of data is inversely proportional to the period of the planet. So if I double the period of the planet, it would be half as likely that I would see it in a fixed window. Okay, so now we have the intrinsic distribution, we have the geometric bias, we have the window effect, and you're probably thinking, please tell me that we're done. Not quite, but we're almost there, we're almost there. The final piece of the puzzle is that the relative position or phase of the planet within our observing window gives us a lower limit for the period. Okay, so look at this transit event here, the period, of this planet must be greater than this green arrow, else we would have seen it transit again. As another example, in this case, the period now must be greater than this green arrow. Putting that together, we can write down that the minimum period in terms of the phase position L and the observing window W 
must be this. All right, so finally now we're in a position to combine all of these effects together to give us our overall prior using the power of Bayes' theorem. So to give you an example, it turns out that if you want to assume a log uniform distribution for your exoplanet periods, then actually you have to adopt p to the index of minus eight thirds to do that, which is definitely not intuitive. So this represents a really strong bias towards short period solutions, and it means that when TESS does start to discover the likely hundreds, even thousands of single transits it will find, the majority of the periods will not be decade-long planets. They're probably just a month or a little bit longer that they just missed catching a second transit. Selection effects are all around us. The things that you notice in the street, the things that you hear about on the news, the things that you read about in a book do not necessarily represent the ground truth. Biases plague almost all types of inference, but by understanding and even quantifying the bias, we can deconvolve it, we can de-bias ourselves. Hopefully you've enjoyed learning about how we can do that here in this case of single transits. If you wanna learn more about it, I'll put a link down below in the description where you can actually find the recently written paper I've submitted. So you can look out on this channel very soon for a couple of videos from Emily Sanford, one of our very own here, who has been working on a really beautiful problem for the last year now and is excited to share it with you pretty soon. So stay tuned for that. If you haven't already and you wanna get videos like that, then make sure you click the subscribe button. If you have any questions about this video, then as always, put them down below in the comments and I'll try my best to get back to you. Okay, thank you so much for watching everybody and until the next video, stay thoughtful and stay curious.